We have Deputy Saha. We have Cyrus. And Trishina. Can we have a round of applause for all of the dear students and schools who will be very happy to go to the class outside? Yes, because 
the history of the family and the brand in India. But uh, honestly, I uh, I prefer attainable classics. So, for example, there's a big generation of us, uh, my age, people younger than me, who do not like the stuff from the pre-war era. Um, I wouldn't care for anything pre-1950, for example. It doesn't interest me at all. It's, it's got beautiful lines, yes, but the whole generation is moving to more modern classics. The generation is moving to stuff from the 80s, for example. Modern classics. Yes. And uh, in fact, you see that, I mean, we're sitting in an auction house, so you see that across auctions too. Cars from the 80s, cars from the early 90s are going for $100,000, where 10 years ago they were a $5,000 car. So there's a whole generation of people moving from uh, Duesenberg and early Rolls Royces to, uh, we've seen Ferraris going absolutely bonkers, to Japanese stuff, uh, early Nissan, Stuart, et etc. Uh, just more and more attainable stuff. Stuff we had on our walls, which was current growing up, and now we can buy, because it's cheap today, is the stuff we like. And that's a big movement. It's a bigger movement for that, and more passionate movement for that as compared to the pure classic guys. So there has been a movement on social media, isn't it? You are like a crazy fan <laughs> following of all the youngsters following you. That's a little... <laughs> okay. So, uh, so great, so this is where we are, and but how does it feel? So when we look at historical vehicles, we always look at these beauty charms and uh, their design, there's, uh, there's a whole lot of uh, essence and a, you know, a deeper meaning to it. Revani, you've been an industrial, you're an industrial product designer, and do you think going forward in an autonomous world where we have driverless cars and so-called the box-looking cars maybe, can we have a balance or where can we maintain that essence where we also keep that historical design fact intact with the autonomous industry? I see a sort of bifurcation happening where there's a complete redefinition of what is automotive. So, uh, but I would not mix it up. It's just like when you look at paintings, uh, mm -hmm. there's a tremendous amount of originality and the more uh, you see that in painting, the higher the value. And in the same way, when you look back at classics, you can recognize uh, a passion and originality there. Um, so it would never die. They would be collector's items. But I find it difficult to, to see how uh, you could sort of map that onto the new autonomous uh, vehicle or the uh, sharing economy, the shared economy that's happening now, I, I don't see that happening. Um, um, yeah, well, I mean, I, I don't know if that's the way to rekindle the passion. I, I haven't really thought about that. But I do know, for instance, um, there was a period when people revisited the old aesthetics, like the Volkswagen Beetle was redesigned and the Mini. Um, it, it sort of got everybody thinking and excited in the beginning, but it's just not the same. So, uh, so I don't want. I don't think that kind of an approach would, uh, you know, bring alive classics in in the new new sense or in the new world. Uh, it'll have to be something else. It has to be something else. You've been with. Uh, I think I've been told that the three big logs have been cars, planes, and trains. For you, that's what you've been you've like. Literally designed the front end and the interiors of the train, and uh, so-called uh, special vehicles. So, uh, is it a bit different designing uh, those in terms of? Uh, so you mean different from cars? Uh, yes. The thing is, the way I see it also is that the older classics were um, more based on personalities. You had great designers. And you got the classics that push technology, but also had the quirks of those designers. Today, what happens is uh, this whole thing of automotive design has been so institutionalized. It's like design by um, by consensus. I mean, can you ever imagine uh, a painting uh, having any any weight or value if it's done by consensus? No, right? It comes straight from the heart. So, so that it's lost. So that's that is lost. So, so I still feel, uh, in in terms of the special vehicles and the trains, uh, it's not yet been institutionalized like that. So there is still more space for expression. Uh, in the automotive world, 
right now difficult as far as the mass produced vehicles. Right. So, um, Prithvi, Prithvi Nand uh, Jagor, would you like to add something to, um, well, we understand the designing part of it. Do we have, we have this uh, constant myth that we have, you know, there's a lot of restoration, there's a painful, it's kind of a tedious job to be done and also a very expensive task. Do you think that's a kind of a myth or it's something which one has to live with? Japan has a vintage car. Uh, no, I, I would say it's a myth, actually. Because uh, me along with two other friends, we started this group in Calcutta last year. I'm from Calcutta. We took a cue from Bombay's classic driver's group and started something similar in Calcutta. And... Uh, What's it called? It's called Classic Drivers of Calcutta, CDC. CDC. And... We had uh, youngsters joining, which was our intention, to get the young enthusiasts out. And they have early ambassadors, early Fiat's, 50s and 60s Fiat's. And those cars don't really, you know, require much in terms of restoration costs. They can be restored, repaired, well in uh, your normal garages or workshops. And uh, so to that extent, I would say that no, if you buy a usable, those are classic cars today. I mean, I myself picked up a 63 Fiat just a few months back. I wouldn't have thought of it, but you know, now a 63 or a late 50s Fiat is actually quite an appealing buy uh, for a lot of us. And uh, so those cars, you know, are not really time consuming or it's, it's not painful to restore. And with the internet now, uh, even if you have a classic which is has more pedigree uh, and has uh, more extensive parts is rare you can virtually get uh, everything on the internet now you can order it online and you know that helps a lot going back to cdc how you mentioned classic drivers, drivers of, of calcutta, calcutta. Yeah. Um, a lot of youngsters as you said that you come across and uh, you bring these myths so is there, uh, is there a, do you think there's a constant need of such probably CDCs and more clubs like that in communities that we need to really get together? Because we all right now have like individuals, so like how we have this event today, we all have gathered and suddenly it makes such a huge uh, impact in a sense. So do you think we need to have such constant uh, clubs running around? Absolutely. I think we need that uh, more and more, uh, especially since, you know, uh, our topic which is autonomous cars and uh, the future of electric cars, I think it's only a matter of time before more electric cars are on the road. So to keep this movement alive and to keep these cars on the, you know, on the road and not be forgotten, public interaction has to be uh, you know, has to be increased. Uh, visibility of these cars has to be increased. And even if it's just the general public, these drives, our intention with CDC is not to have just static displays, but to actually drive the cars for people to see and people to get involved and get people to appreciate. So more experiential, uh, yes. you know, that's just a display of Absolutely. certain cars and that's, that's the way forward. Uh, that's another word that comes to me as you're telling top to bottom. Uh, Alphisto? Alphisto. That's what uh, Viram is usually called and he's saying why is that Alphisto coming and where is it coming from? Right, so uh, somebody who's very passionate about, about the brand Alfa Romeo is called an Alphisto. And uh, basically Alphisto is the plural and I think almost every Italian is an Alphisto. But uh, there's one in India that's me. And, and it's uh, not just, I mean, what all of Alf, please mention that as well. <laughs> so, so basically, if you see, I'm a diet in, a, in you know, Alpha clothes, from my shoes to my t-shirt to my watch to my white phone to my belt to everything. Uh, it's just because I'm, you know, very passionate about the brand. And as far as I'm concerned, what I'm really interested in is a car I can use and drive and enjoy. Uh, and that's what the brand Alpha brings, you know, this, this small, you can drive them in Bombay traffic, on the bad roads in Bombay, they're speedy, 
nice handling, you know, that, that's what I enjoy. And I'm not fussed about an air conditioning, so that's fine. I can tolerate the weather. Yeah, that's what I was about to say, actually. The youngsters feel a lot of this, like, okay, fine, no ACs, nothing. So I'm sure even your daughters, Yes. They uh, my elder daughter, when she started driving, was very happy to take the Alpha. It's left-hand drive, so she said, just put the steering wheel on the right and give me an AC and I'm going to use it every day. So needless to say, she's never driven it. But there is a something that there's a there's a sort of process of convenience and comfort that uh, we all have kind of uh, been victimized with, and we all feel good at the end of the day with the air-conditioned car, right? Of course, you 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 know when I drove here today, I got out of the car, I had a wet back, but uh, all the others who got out of nice air-conditioned cars came looking fresh. And I looked like I had a rough day, which I had. Cyrus, would you like to add something on uh, on the automotive world again as you've been in the industry of automotive journalism? How do you... Uh, so I'd actually like to go back to a comment you made, uh, designed by... Uh, consensus. consensus. That's a phenomenal term. I'm definitely going to use that. Uh, it, it's true. There are cars today and the 2000s which were absolutely rubbish in terms of design. Everything looked the same, everything felt the same, etc. Now though, with the electric cars coming in and autonomous cars coming in, there is a flip side to the advantage that not many people are seeing. Uh, with electric cars, most of your mechanical bits, or whatever mechanical bits do exist in terms of a motor and a battery pack, are all down on the ground. It's going to be a platform chassis that everybody else uses. Probably going to be a couple of component makers in the world that are going to make these platforms and everybody is going to use that. It's going to bring costs down. What that does though is open up a whole it's a whole lot of possibilities for designers to go completely bonkers. And we've seen that. We've seen this resurgence of design coming in the past three or four years where every Geneva show, for example, has absolutely phenomenal looking electric cars, mass market cars and supercars. And of course, then you're looking at the whole hypercar there and Pininfarina now getting into production of cars, etc. But there is a moment of uh, coach building. I'm actually going to go as far and say coach building that's coming in. Not, we're back to a chassis, we're back to a platform, and we're back to people who are going to build these bodies, and it's essentially going to be the same platform underneath. So all your cars are going to do 0 to 100 in say, 2 seconds, 3 years from now, but not all, all the performance cars. Uh, and they're all going to have phenomenal looking bodies, because you don't have a big lumpy engine in the front or at the back, you don't have a big axle, you don't have a big massive piece of mechanical bit sticking out somewhere. It's all going to go back to that design uh, sort of purity. That's an I agree. Um, I just wanted to expand on uh, what he was talking about, the driver's club. And is it important to have more of these clubs? I think it is. Uh, people need to see what was there before. And I think there also needs to be a bit of unity because I believe, for instance, the government of India at one point decided that uh, we couldn't import tires. Now, that was done because of some lobby, but obviously they didn't have classic cars in mind. And I do know some of my friends who really suffered because they wanted to bring in some old tires for their vehicles and they couldn't. So, uh, you know, you have, to, you have to have your lobby and I think uh, that's why it's also important. And also, a lot of support is required, I guess, like how we have these norms of uh, pollutants and pollution emissions from the cars and so the unity with actually uh, when we all get together that's that's where we actually can fight it out and show the essence of it. Prithvi was actually adding on to that when we were chatting. Uh, yes, so uh, about when said like, this unity part is very important. For a long time the Indian classic car scene in particular, I would say, has been based on individuals. It's been very individual, individualistic. Whereas in Europe, in the US, you have a lot of car shows which are interactive, like SEMA, for example, in the US, uh, where a lot of these niche workshops, etc., you know, they have a certain product that they display, and a lot of interest is generated amongst the youth. So what is important is basically to keep the idea alive amongst the youth for the future because it's, as I said, it's only a matter of time because of increasing pollution levels.